Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on items not on today's agenda? Hearing none, let us go to the first item, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Two items today, we'll be talking about the quarterly investment report for the quarter into December 31st, 2014, and then we'll follow with the golf fund discussion. So here's a quick outline. We're gonna just talk a little bit about the investing environment, what the economic factors are that are relevant to our investing, what the interest rate environment is looking like today. And in, the, in that context, what our investment strategy and approach is, what are some of the long-term trends in terms of our earnings and interest rates, and then something you probably haven't seen before, but a comparison to some benchmarks, and then we'll final complete with a quick review of the performance and activity for the quarter. So economic factors, there are a lot of good things, a lot of positive signs in the economy, yet we're still seeing that interest rates are low and, and consumer confidence isn't quite where it needs to be. Interest rates are, are expected to continue to be low um, for the foreseeable future. Um, you would expect that with all these great things going on with consumer spending will be a lot better and consumer confidence will be strong, but it's quite not, it's just not there yet. There's some concerns over what's going on in, in Europe. Um, they're going through deflation essentially and, and their interest rates are even lower than ours. And then the impacts of declining oil prices on not only here in the US, but the global economies are, are raising concerns apparently. And what's been happening, at least in terms of what we're seeing from an investing perspective, is that there's been a significant shift from the, the equities, the stock market, to U.S. Treasuries. And this is what they refer to as a flight to quality. When there's always a concern about the equities, people go to what's safe, which are Treasuries, which means that the prices of the Treasuries go up and the yields go then conversely down. So we're just, we've been seeing that in the last couple of months. So they still remain exceptionally low. Um, in fact, today's dates, as of January 20. Uh, 26th or 27th are actually lower than they were back in December. So we're still seeing some declines in the yields. And as I said, the, the forecast from the Federal Reserve is that the low yields will continue into the near future. So how, what we do with this, our approach is what is referred to in the industry as SLY. Safety first is first and then liquidity and then yields. So we never, our, never, our primary focus is never on yields. That's the third priority for us. So we always just buy into the market, whether the interest rates are low or high. We don't try to anticipate or project what interest rates are going to do and make investment decisions on that. Whatever the market is, we buy into that. Uh, we have a five-year window in, during which we invest. That's, that's per investment policy, so we can't go beyond five years unless council specifically approves that. So we're basically investing in a, over a five-year period, and we're basically filling gaps. We want to make sure we're buying into the market, whatever the yields are, but over a five-year period on a fairly even basis. We don't want to be too heavy in any one year because if we sort of stack up uh, like everything in a two-year basis, we may be having to have maturities occur all at the same time when we have interest rates significantly low. So we just kind of ride the market and make sure we're evenly distributed. And that also makes sure we have enough maturity, I'm, I'm sorry, enough liquidity during that five-year period to pay all of our bills. So we're not trying to go again too heavy in any one period of time. We spread over a five-year period and just buy into the market. So these are the yields. This is a four-year trend of the key rates. So in the lighter blue is the city's portfolio yield. And you can see in 2011, the same quarter, it was 1.67. It went down to 1.43 in 12, and it's continuing to go down. So to 1.26, and then just more recently, if I could still, you see 1.17. So the trend is still down on the yields. Um, we think it's going to flatten out. We think that we're kind of at the bottom, but we're not sure. There, there are some concerns that they can go even lower, which sounds impossible, but it, that's, there, there are some concerns about that. So we won't see that turning around for a while. I mean, we're going to be investing in this market, and we're investing in one, two, three, four-year paper. So whenever interest rates do turn around, it'll be a while before those investments mature and we can start investing in a higher interest rate. So we're going to see low interest rates on our yields and our investments and interest earnings as well for some time. And then just the other, other sort of key rates, you could see there is the two-year treasury, which is a common um, benchmark. It's been pretty flat for the last uh, several years. It has bumped up a little bit, but it's just, we think it's a temporary blip. This is, I think, is pretty, pretty amazing. If this goes all the way back to 2000, fiscal 2000. The blue line represents what our actual earnings were in, in that year. And then the red line represents what our yields are. So the blue line relates to the left, the red to the right. You can see in 2001, 
the city as a whole generated over eight and a half million dollars in interest earnings, a portion of which is general fund and spread out through all the various funds. It dropped substantially during the after 9-11, bumped back up, but we are now down to two million citywide in terms of interest earnings. That's just how dramatic this is. And it's these are historical low rates. You can see similarly the interest, the yield in our portfolio has just been gone down and went up again after the, the recession of 2001 and two, but then tanked since the most recent recession. And we're still very, very low. So again, this is we're gonna see this for the next few years until interest rates make a, a, a big change and a permanent change and we can start investing in that environment. This is a comparison to the benchmark. So we, you know, one of the things we, we've shown this to you, but not in the sense, in the sense of context of a, of a benchmark. What this tells you and should tell you as a committee mem member is that you can see the blue is our portfolio rate. So that's this line here. The red is a treasury and then LAIF, what that's short-term liquidity. We should be following and tracking these trends and we should be just slightly above in terms of what we're earning because we do invest longer than a two-year treasury. We go beyond two years at times. We also buy corporates that give us a little more yield, but we shouldn't be too far apart from that. If you see our portfolio yield being substantially higher than those other benchmarks, that would suggest to you that we are too being too aggressive with our investments for taking too many risks or either poor quality investments or just risky investments. So you should see us pretty close to this. In fact, we probably should tend, trend pretty closely to the five-year treasury, which we do. There's a little bit of lag because there's always a time period between us investing and when the rates change. But we should be really close to this, and you can see we are. We're, we're almost trending exactly, just other than the timing difference. Um, so again, if you saw us anything above that or materially below that, you should it should raise questions in your mind that why are we either too conservative or too aggressive? Mr. Samario, how far above or how far below? I think we should be tracking, and I was just having this conversation with somebody else yesterday, but I think we should be tracking pretty closely to the five-year treasury. It's uh, we don't buy a lot of just straight treasury. We buy what are called agency securities. So we have a which gives us a little premium. We also invest in uh, corporate securities. We also invest longer or at least up to five years. So on average, with all of those factors, we should be pretty close to the five-year treasury, and and we are. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? So in terms of how we did this past quarter. As I mentioned, our portfolio yield is actually slightly down um, from the previous quarter, just slightly from 1.179 to 1.73. Um, I'm hoping one of these days they'll start to climb up. We're still kind of trending downward. The portfolio interest earned during the quarter citywide was 457 for the quarter, and the general funds portion of that was 133,000. The activity during the quarter, we had $9 million in purchases. We had $12 million in callables, and I'll go back to that in a second. And then we had um, about $2 million in, maturi in maturity, and we also had the airport payoff, a portion of their promissory note, totaling 136000 So the net activity was a de decrease in our investment portfolio, which just goes into our bank account of $5 million. The cult securities up above, those are um, investments that we purchased that could be a three or four or five year security, but they all, they contain a call protection. So the issuer is able to, to call those earlier than what is stated on the term. Um, just in case interest rates turn against them, they can call them. But for that, they pay us a little bit more interest or more yield. So we buy those recognizing they're likely gonna call them, but we pick up a little few few basis points rather than just going to either lay for something comparably, um, comparably termed security. This, these are our investments as of December 31st. Uh, the first row is what we have with Union Bank. That's just money in, in, we have in a checking account. And you may, may recall that our current contract gives us some earnings credit for that. So it reduces our costs, our banking costs. We have $24 million in LAIF. We have $9 million in CDs, $10 million in, in Treasury securities. And then what I mentioned earlier, the federal agency securities, we have most of our money, almost $90 million. And then corporate medium term notes, $12 million. And then you can see the promissory note we have with the airport of about 5.2, and it diminishes it diminishes every year. Our total cash and investments, $168.3 million. This gives you kind of a three or four year look on both our portfolio and interest income and also our yield. So our cash balance has been pretty stable over the last four years. Our investment income has is continues to go down. And this is just for the quarter, the investment income. And you see the portfolio yield correspondingly going down. 
So that concludes my report and the action we're looking for today is to re recommend council's acceptance and approval of the fourth quarter and this should see second quarter investment report and then includes the fiscal agent report. Okay. Any questions or comments from committee members? One. Mr. White. Chair, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Samari, for your report. Um, and that is that not only you have on here the reduced uh, revenues, but that's in the face of having, I believe, higher principal on hand. And that would be a question, I guess, is how would this compare to the amounts of money that is, is, uh, is there yeah, to earn this? Good question. Uh, I don't know exactly, but my guess is that the amount of money we had to invest back in 2000 is, le is less than what we have today. Right. So that you know, makes it more dramatic when you think about exactly. how much we were earning back then. And and uh, and that might be helpful just for folks to to see that uh, just that um, we actually have been accumulating a bit of money uh, in our reserves and such and and uh, so that's one piece and the other one is that the good news of, uh, about all of this is that the dollar is uh, the flight to quality is to a strong dollar and at least what we have here is uh, is a strong currency and uh, is uh, able to have. A lot of purchasing power in many things. It still doesn't seem to get our streets paved, but uh, uh, in any case, I think it's uh, that's that's one of the reasons for all these low interest rates. And there are, I think, there are two. There's at least one country, if not two, where um, the government uh, rates of return are negative. That's true. Where uh, I believe it's Denmark or something that's that's uh, actually yeah. gone negative. So the U.S. Uh, is still a good deal from an investment perspective, foreign investment, because the rates at one percent are better than negative. That's true. Thank you, Mr. In that case, I would entertain a motion. Move the staff recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next item. Welcome. Use to my microphone. Good afternoon, committee members. I'm Mark Seward. I'm from the Parks and Recreation Department, business analyst, and with me today is Nancy Rapp, the Parks and Recreation Director. And uh, we're delighted to return before you after after the council gave us direction to return with a, a few answers to some questions from our um, council meeting on the 9th of December last year. So. Okay. So, um, council in December last year after a very lengthy conversation, um, asked us to return with options for the Golf Fund in terms of refinancing the golf course debt, in terms of opportunities to improve the golf course marketing, and to what extent there are any opportunities to look at the maintenance that we currently have at the course in, return, in regard to how much can be done in-house and by other people. Okay, so what I wanted to do before we got into those specific answers, those questions, just update you with where we are now that we've had six months of, of trading in fiscal year 15 and to sort of uh, let you know what we're seeing. And so this chart up, what you can see on the screen now, splits the, the fiscal year into two halves and shows you what's happened in FY13, last year FY14, and this year in FY15. And so you can see in the top part of the table up here, our revenue is down versus FY14 by 10%. And a lot of the projections that we've been bringing to you before around what do the long-range um, forecasts look like. I've been talking about minus three, flat, 1% growth. Um, however, we've seen uh, a real decline in the first six months of the year, which uh, we can attribute, we think, to drought impacts and um, also increased competition in the competitive market as other golf courses are experiencing similar challenges. And also, we had a fantastic November and December in 2013 from a weather standpoint where we didn't see the rain come the flip side of that, of course, it doesn't help the drought, but we lose about four to $5,000 per day that we have rain on the mm. golf course. And so with a few rain events this year, which we didn't have last year, that exacerbates the issue. And so what we've also done is looked at where do we think the second half of the year will go for the golf course. And so you can see how we had some reasonable growth between FY13 and 14. And we're also projecting 
some growth in FY15. And that on the face of it might look quite bullish. Um, but what we factored into our projections are a number of different things. Firstly, we had a $1 price increase which applied in January, which was delayed originally from July of, FY, of, of 2014. So that $1 is worth $30,000 if we don't see any real attrition. We feel that $1 is acceptable to most golfers and won't impact on play. We also, in our um, months of May and June last fiscal year, saw a real decline in play in, in, in consequence to some of the drought measures that we were putting in place. Um, we were really reducing the amount of water on the golf course and perhaps could be accused of going a little too far. And I don't think the community at that time, with other go golf courses being quite green still, were accepting of that and were able to play elsewhere where it was a lot greener. And so we've, we've took, the, took the assumption that we feel that we won't lose that level of play. Um, and that cost us about $30,000 last year, we think. Um, and on top of that, which I'll come on to in a minute in terms of the marketing efforts, we're, we're deciding that we're going to actually really upweight our marketing effort. And we believe that that will yield some results uh, with some of the things that we're looking to do. So it's by no means guaranteed, but it's still a fair expectation of where we believe we will end the year. Okay. Um, so that's the next slide. In terms of the three things that, therefore, that council looked to, to ask uh, asked us to come back with, the golf debt sits at 1.37 million at the start of this fiscal year in FY15. And that's broken down into three main areas. One is the Municipal in Improvement COP, which has a $180,000 a year repayment. The next one is the General Fund Loan, which currently the principal is not being paid down on, the interest only, which once the COP were paid off, the plan would be to then pay off the principal. And then the final part of that is the fleet loan, where there's a $223,000 balance, which is being paid off. Okay? So the 1.3 is summarized in that. And our annual payments are therefore $262,000 through FY18, and then $185,000 from 19 through to 22. So as it currently stands, the golf course would be debt free after 2022. Here again is an updated with the assumptions that we've spent some time talking about you know, where we think we're going to end the year, how does we think all of the costs are likely to look going forward and the round levels, et cetera, et cetera. If we don't change the debt and we don't change anything else, here's where we believe the annual cash flow would be from a point of view of flat growth from the projection for where we're going to end this year, a 3% decline or a 1% growth. Okay, so no real change in terms of the order of magnitude to the, to the previous slides that we've shown you about, about the status quo. Here's what it would look like if we were to refinance the debt over 20 years at a 3% interest rate. Okay? So you can see on an annual basis, reducing our cash outflows by having a lower payment would benefit the golf course, but would still, on a 3% decline, and on every year with exception of one, on a flat growth, require the golf fund to dip into reserves. On a 1% growth, of course, then what we see is that you know, the, the golf course starts to return towards a positive cash flow position on an annual basis. And then here's what it would look like in terms of the bank balance, as it were, the reserves for the golf fund. We are projecting that we're going to end the year at $216,000. We started the year at $276,000. So we think we're going to dip into $60,000 of reserves in FY15. And therefore, playing out those scenarios, you can see that with a 3% decline, we would go to a negative balance in the Gulf Fund by FY18. A flat growth, we'd, la we'd last until 2021. And if we grow 1%, then actually our reserves stay liquid, but they still stay around 50% of the policy where we would need to be for capital and, and contingency purposes. Okay, so it's fair to say that refinancing the debt does help the short-term years, but of course extends the debt payments for 14 future years after 2022. With regards to the marketing, we currently do uh, market in print. We use the internet. We do regular email blasts. We are on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. And we also look to work with local partners with regards to hotel deals and, and other things like that, chambers of commerce. The marketing plan is uh, a joint effort from staff ideas, meetings with concessionaires. Our golf advisory committee offer us many ideas 
of course, they play many other golf courses and, and are able to see what other golf courses are offering as we check as well and, and see what, what the market is doing. One of the questions that came up, and a fair question when we presented to council, was the level of investment the golf course has in its marketing and comparing that to the industry. So the industry standard of 3% of Greens fee revenue would equate to around $50,000, maybe a little bit more on a, on a typical year for our golf course. And over the last 10 years, I looked back at how much the golf course had been spending on marketing, it averaged around 1%. So you could, it's fair to say that the investment in marketing has been below what the industry has been doing. And so what we're looking to do, as I said earlier in terms of the projection, is we're looking to rectify that. And we want to increase our spend on marketing in FY15 between now and the end of the year to spend $26,000 on the right things. I'm not just going to throw money at anything, but of course we want to make sure that we're spending it on the right things. And we're going to be coming back with our budget to propose an increase of our marketing to $50,000 or thereabouts to, to bring us in line with where the industry is. And the assumption that we're making with our marketing spend is not all of it's going to necessarily yield straight away, but anything that we spend, we expect to come back in rounds and revenue going forward. Okay. So what does that really mean? Well, um, for a number of weeks now, um, I've been engaging in a search to try and find a, a company who can help us to put a plan together to use their experience. And, and we've been working with a, uh, a golf course marketing um, expert company. Um, and they have presented to us uh, their draft plan for where they think, what we, they think we can do and how they think we can do it and how we can resource it, et cetera, et cetera. And this will then determine our plans for where do we want to spend our money in the next six months and ongoing. Um, we are expecting that actually some of the things are going to be happening quickly and a lot of the other things will take a little bit longer to seed and, and, and put in place. But we do think we should have a reasonable impact and upside within the fiscal year 15. Uh, alongside that and, and dovetailing with it, hopefully, is the new point of sale and booking software, which we've been negotiating with uh, vendors over the last few months. Uh, a contract is now winging its way back and forth um, with some final adjustments ready to be signed, whereby we will dramatically improve the interface our consumers and golfers and anyone interested in the golf course will have with regards to the golf course online. This will be a new website, it will be uh, a new application where people can book tee times very quickly. We're looking to partner with a company that sells over 15 million golf rounds a year in the United States. And well, the, the outreach to non-residents as well as residents will just increase incrementally. Um, moreover, we will have a far more streamlined database and uh, the ability to analyze golfer behavior and understand when people play, why they play, and then be able to look at what sort of offers we want to, to have to entice more in regular play. Okay, so I believe it's twofold. It's one about um, approaching and, and finding golfers who don't know we're here and don't know what a wonderful golf course we have. And it's also about rewarding with enticements and incentives those who do know where we are and do play to see whether we can have them coming back a little more. Okay, so that's, that's really... And, and that information from the new booking system will obviously feed back into the strategic planning about what do we want to do with that information. And then on the third part of the, of the request from Council with regards to the maintenance, um, clearly it's a major cost area for us. 50% um, of our operating costs each year are labour. Um, and then we have supply services, water and equipment. Water last year was about $225,000. And then you have the debt servicing as the other two main areas of cost. So if we looked at the debt servicing, that might help us. And then it's about what can we do with our maintenance costs. So we have been taking reductions over the last five years. And that's been with regards to reducing the um, funded positions, permanent positions. That's with regards to looking at opportunities as retirements and things like that happen about can they be replaced with hourly. And it's also about, unfortunately, sometimes deciding not to do certain maintenance projects because we don't have the funding. And that clearly isn't a strategy that can last forever. It's okay to do in the short term, but these things don't go away. So um, we feel as if there's a limited opportunity for additional savings as it stands without really impacting on the quality of the product to our golf course, to our golfers. Uh, we have a small workforce. It's seven days a week operation. Some of the guys start at three o'clock in the morning. You know, these people are there. They're extremely skilled. Um, they do a great job. And if they make a mistake, it can be quite, you know, quite a detriment to the golf course. If one of them does something to a green, for example, it might take weeks, months to repair. So we trust and rely heavily on our staff 
and they do a very good job. With regards to the opportunity to convert more positions as they were to arrive through retirements, for example, into hourly, we're a little bit hamstrung in, in terms of policy for the 1,000 hour limit that's, you know, that the hourly employees can work. Um, it, increasing headcount makes the management task a lot more difficult to control in terms of um, you know, more people to try and look after the span and control. And ultimately for the, the types of people that we would need to have at the golf course, um, they, the skill level, typically they would be looking for a full-time job, which we could give them for six months but then unfortunately would have to, they'd have to leave. So it creates a real burden on management to try and maintain a crew that's adequately trained, motivated, and cares for the long term of the course. So like I say, we, we evaluate that case by case as opportunities arise. Um, and then the, finally, we feel there's a limited opportunity for additional contracting. And the important word there is additional. We do currently contract out a number of services that our staff aren't doing. So for example, tree work would be a good example. Um, we contract out tree work. We recently uh, upgraded uh, a number of tee boxes as part of the player improvement fund, which was um, project managed by staff, but ultimately undertaken by professional bodies who can come out with all the right equipment and all the right materials. So whilst most of the day-to-day -day maintenance, if not all of the day-to-day -day maintenance, is undertaken by the maintenance city crew, there are a number of tasks which come up which are outsourced to, to, to be able to keep that continuity of, of um, maintenance with our crews. So in summary, unfortunately, rounds and revenue is down at mid-year um, and speak to some of our more pessimistic projections when we review before around where it might go. Refinancing the debt does improve the short-term um, uh, outlook, but it doesn't necessarily resolve the long-term outlook. Um, as I showed you on the previous slides with the reds and the greens, it can help us in, in some of the sh earlier years to, to pay our bills, but doesn't necessarily um, solve the whole solution. Uh, increased marketing will likely strengthen our financial performance, and it's something w we will be doing. It's a, it's, a, it's a fair challenge. And like I say, we feel that there's limited opportunity for additional maintenance savings without impacting on, on the quality of the course. So that all being said, none of us really know exactly where the golf trend is going to go. Um, the industry has in the past been optimistic and stated 1% to 2% growths, yet when they've had hindsight and looked at it five years later, it hasn't quite always turned out in that way. So that's clearly unknown and, and can make a difference to the numbers as you project them forward. Um, we think the revenue rounds will grow with improved marketing. We have... Um, our current concession agreements, which come to a, an end in June 2016, that if we were to go out and maintain the status quo, would likely commit the Gulf Fund to 2021 on a five-year term on the status quo model. Um, if we don't see the financial picture improve, then the exposure to the general fund is between 60 and half a million dollars per year, depending on which model you want to look at for anticipated growth or decline. And one thing to say, you know, maintenance could be revisited under a separate contract at any time. Um, however, it's fair to say that right now we have 11 full-time funded positions at the golf course, of which by the time the contracts finalise in June 2016, eight of those 11 will be eligible for retirement. And of course, if the decision were delayed or taken in future, the likelihood of that number being eight would be different and therefore discussions of finding roles in general fund programs etc might well be more people so the the timing is important within that regard as to um, how the contracts end in 2016 and then the commitment for a further five years in that piece so the what we're asking for you today then is to provide a recommendation to the council on the options to improve the long-term financial sustainability of the municipal golf course and i thank you for your time Thank you, Mark. First, any questions from the committee? Mr. White. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your report. Um, so there are 11 um, full-time staffers doing the maintenance now. In the pool of parks department staffers, how many, what's the, what's the, how many comparable skill uh, work level folks are there in the park department, would there be? 
in ballpark numbers if it's uh, committee member white and finance committee members there are some comparables and and others not uh, we do have an irrigation specialist at the golf course and we have that position at parks and they do similar work um, the <coughs> park staff by and large have far more emphasis and working knowledge of horticulture than the golf maintenance staff would. Their area of expertise is golf course turf. And so that, that is a, a pretty significant difference, although their titles of their positions are grounds maintenance worker one and grounds maintenance worker two and a senior grounds maintenance worker. But the scope of what they do on a daily basis is different. However, if we were going to make room, we would be looking at those similar positions in the parks division, in, the, in public works, at the airport, at the waterfront. Um, and so similar to when we went through the recession, people exactly. might be doing something different, but they would still have a job. Exactly. Um, so, and I would, having gone through that process, Mark and I were just talking about that earlier today, you know, it's a very creative process when you're trying to find people, places for people to land um, that does allow them to stay employed and to be at an appropriate job for what they bring to the job in terms of skills and knowledge. So... I don't know if that really... I didn't get a number. What, what would be the... How many folks... Again, I've asked you to... I'm not asking for a down to the person, but are there 20 other in the organization? Are there 100 other in the organization? Kind of thing. Within the organization, I don't know. I'd have to research that. And I respect that answer a lot. I really do. <laughs> you know. But I, I, you know, actually, it's something that I could get from HR and I could follow up with an email because I think it's okay. pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hart? I'm sorry. I don't have a question. Okay. Any public comment on this topic? Please make your way to the lectern here. And please inform us of your name for the record. And uh, if you can keep your comments to two minutes, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. I will do so. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Leslie Wiscom. I'm here as uh, the chairman of the Parks and Recreation Commission. And I've also, for the last uh, several years, on and off served as the liaison to the Golf Advisory Committee. And um, at our November 2014 regular meeting, the Parks and Rec Commission heard a report from staff on the status of the golf course, including the trends, financial projections, and options the city might consider to improve the financial outlook for the continued operation of the golf course. The report was very similar to um, the full report that City Council received in December. But without exception, commissioners emphasize three points that I'd like to bring up. Um, number one, that this resource and asset should be kept available to the public, and I don't believe that any of you dispute that. Uh, number two, that irrespective of the solution eventually accepted by city council, it should be a financially viable, sustainable model that protects this asset for our present and future generations, particularly in light of the impressive growth uh, in the youth participation at the golf course, which we've experienced over the last five years. And three, finally, that the solution selected should be one where the city retains a majority of control in order to respond to local conditions and industry trends to help foster youth, senior, and women's programs and play at the course, and to better market our course to the golfing public. So in summary, the commission hopes that the Finance Committee's recommendation will be a sustainable solution, a solution that's a long-term win-win for this important public asset and the people that enjoy it. And after all, I think that a solution that benefits our golf course will also benefit the city long-term. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is uh, Dominic Namnith. I am representing the uh, Golf Advisory Committee, of which I've been a member for probably seven or eight years now, and I've been the chair for the last few years. Um, I just wanted to come in and just reiterate some of the things that you've already heard. Um, and most importantly to me is, you know, the diversity of the golf course is so important to the community and myself. Um, it's a unique resource. It's a valuable resource, and it's it's worthy of the support of the city and the, and the taxpayers and, and the Department of Finance or Finance Committee. Uh, the solutions that have been outlined, I think, are viable. Um, I think the golf course is worth it. Um, and, you know, refinancing it um, for all the, you know, the extension of the debt and things like that. I think it's something that, from a long-term perspective, is something that we can sustain. Um, I think re-looking at and playing out the scenario with looking at the maintenance uh, contract and seeing if we can outsource that, I think is a viable solution as, as far as looking into it and putting that back on the table to, to play that scenario out. Um, and I would just urge you to support those, those types of initiatives, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bryant. My name is Bryant Henson. I'm uh, also on the GAC, and I'm a marshal of over 10 years, and I addressed this committee before. And I just want to offer a couple other opinions. Um, there is no business that can operate in perpetuity without occasional reinvestment, upgrade, or improvement, and especially one that is, was intended to be a break-even operation. Any business would fail with that formula or plan, not investing money. A $500,000 investment as far as a uh, debt forgiveness as opposed to refinancing would completely eliminate all of the issues of repayment from the golf course. And it's similar in, in cost to the COP payments that would be uh, put onto the general fund from the uh, if it were to be refinanced anyway. So either way, 500000 seems to solve the issue for the next five years. And going forward, we only need to make it to seven years for the, uh, that other loan of the building. So um, I, would please, I would urge you to please consider the impact of the PIF as well, or the Players Improvement Fund, as it will have um, as akin to marketing, as we invest more things, uh, projects into the golf course, uh, it, will, it will create play at the golf course because, you know, you're going to market things, but um, the actual improvement to the golf course is what is going incre in to increase the play. And your decision today should help Muni thrive and not burden it with debt. Thank you. Um, hello, members of the Finance Committee. My name is Cynthia Gawenna. I represent SEIU Local 620 and uh, the members of our maintenance staff who are performing at the, um, at the golf course now. Uh, we are opposed to contracting out as we do not believe that it is viable and would urge the other proposals that have been um, recommended by staff, um, including refinancing, better marketing, improve, improving the interface, and bringing up those revenues. Of all the reasons that have been given for the revenue going down, uh, maintenance quality at the course has never been one of them. So there is a concern that that would be looked to as the um, first line to uh, reduce costs. Um, ha as um, the report of the golf course expert who uh, turned it in, turned in their um, full report on this issue states, um, he estimates that it would be over a million dollars to contract out the maintenance uh, work. The current, and his report for some reason says that the actual right now is 1369000 I I'm not sure where that number came from because all the other numbers we've been given are just a little bit over $1 million and the actual costs on the maintenance staff is is maybe 950, 900, something like that. So if the current staff is costing 950 and the expert is proposing that um, contracting out would be over a million, I don't see that as a source of savings. Um, 
and I don't think you would either. Uh, so as staff has also pointed out, um, the skilled workers who are there are skilled, trained, reliable. They're doing a good job. They're, we, we are expressing concern with replacing full-time trained persons who know that course and are doing an excellent job with um, either an outside contract person and even as a long-term uh, with hourly or short-term people that we don't believe um, will, just, will justify that minimal savings that could result from that. Uh, that we also have a continuing concern with uh, relocating these employees. It has not been made clear to us that there is anywhere for them to land. They have a special expertise in what they do. Um, they're doing a good job, and we urge the Finance Committee to recommend the refinancing, the better marketing, and um, any other cost uh, savings that might be available to them without uh, destroying the team that is there and the good job that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Craig. Um, I'm currently the chairperson for the Players Improvement Fund. And uh, actually, last night at our meeting, we finalized our board members. And we're going to continue to invest in the product that we have. And hopefully, we're going to encourage more golfers to come out. That's going to try to alleviate the problem. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that our main competitor, Glen Annie, um, they're now under the management contracts of Touchstone but they're under the umbrella of Capital Crossing Servicing Company. And uh, they're a huge conglomerate that buys up properties all over the country, not so much in the West Coast, but they, they bought up Glen Annie and uh, the, the last, I don't know whether it was the last council meeting, but anyway, their, their investment proposals are to um, make zoning changes and then go in and develop around the golf course. Well. Galita Council shut them down, so now that chunk of property has been losing money all this time. So I, I understand that they uh, just had an offer in escrow that fell through. So, um, and since that is our main competitor, I think it's wise for us just to let the status quo go maybe for a year or two to find out what's going to happen to the Glen Annie Golf Course. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman. My name is Pete Lamontier, and I work with the junior programs at the course. Um, I'm in favor of just a growth model for this. After you're hearing, like, for instance, on the refinancing, we can save some money there. We're only doing 1% so far on marketing. So if we save some money on the refinancing, we put it a little bit more into, like, a 3% marketing. Here's the good news about the course. We've got some tea times open. I mean, way back when in the 1980s when things were just boring along, you couldn't get a tea time at this golf course or any golf course. Let's say you had a revenue problem then. Not much you could do with it. You couldn't grow it. The course would already be full. We've got some room now to grow. We've got baby boomers that are getting ready to retire. I'm sort of on the tail end of that. All right? We've got the kids that are coming along every year. We see more growth, more kids, more kids. The other thing I like about that is I start to think a little bit about what about families. The kids play golf, and I know when people are working, mom works, dad works, it's a little difficult. Maybe a little bit more of a push towards family programs at the course. The really cool thing about Muni is no other course has the amount of junior programs that this has. And you think about it, too. Now, Twin Lakes is a par-3 course. They have a first tee. But we have a complete 18-hole golf course. All right? right now, the first tee programs are going into the schools. They have what's called the National Schools Program. So for the first time, kids are getting PE courses where they're getting acclimated to not just soccer, not just football, not just baseball, but golf as well. And we're starting to see an impact with that. We're starting to see more kids come in, look at the program, and say, hey, you know what, this looks like fun. I did this at school. I need to go to a place and try it out. Well, guess where they come? And most of it, marketing, website. You mentioned a better website? You bet. My youth golf website that I put together about five years ago, that's where I get most of these kids, most of the contact emails. They come right through the youth golf website. So different types of marketing like that, different types of growth, and we only need, what, like 1% or so just to start to get solvent again? I think that's well within reach. Anyways, I'm energized about it. I'd like to do something in that particular model. 
And like uh, Ms. Rapp said, if you try to reorganize just the employees, it, it could hurt the course. It might mean we don't have quite as good maintenance because Simone and the crew out there, they do a magnificent job. I've played a lot of golf courses. This course is kept up extremely well, and that's a big, big, big benefit. I wouldn't want to gamble making a change on that. Besides, when you think about it, we shift some employees around, and maybe I'm not right about this. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that just put the burden of the payments, because they're still going to have their jobs, they're still going to make their salaries, on some other uh, city-sponsored project? Uh, in other words, as a net, it isn't going to save the city of Santa Barbara or anything. It's just going to make the golf course look better for stats. So the reshuffling, I, I don't know. I don't see how the city of Santa Barbara comes ahead with that. But with the growth model, I think we've got some potential. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marilyn Freeman. I play at Muni. I also am the president of the EWGA Executive Women's Golf Club, who has our home uses Muni as our home course. Um, and I guess I've been to a number of these meetings, and I'm a little concerned that what I'm seeing today is a direction towards solving the short-term issues. How do we get the extra rounds? Let's put some money. Let's get some more golfers. Let's refinance the debt from when we remodeled 25 years ago. <laughs> but I'd like to encourage you to look a little longer term. The course is in as good a shape as it can be with the drought, but the pro shop and the restaurant, they're already looking like buildings that have been remodeled 25 years ago. Um, I see that the plans, the, the numbers presented today show that if we have some growth, we can get half of our reserve back. I haven't seen numbers that say, how do we get all of our reserve back? What are we planning for the next remodel instead of refinancing from the 25-year-old <laughs> remodel? <laughs> so anyway, I'd just like to encourage you to look a little longer term, find a solution that will keep this place going so we're not all back here in five years going, well, <laughs> now what do we do? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment. First, questions from committee members? I have a question. Mr. Hart. Um, you talked about the new website. Is Does that include a phone application as well, too? Is that part of the, the plan to have the website upgraded? Chair Francisco, Council Member Hart, yes. Yeah. Um, the, the new website is part of the online package, um, and there will be um, basically the, where the industry is right now in terms of golf is the ability to just go onto your smartphone, click onto one website, and you see all the tea inventory in one place, okay. and you can just one click and you're in. That's great. And it seamlessly talks to the people in the pro shop so that they know that that person is going to come and play at that time. Well, so, um, the presentation today in response to what we asked for at the council meeting is just spectacular. I think this is exactly what we're looking for. Really encouraged by the marketing effort, you know, taking this refinancing approach seriously. These, this, the numbers look very different today than they did back in December, and I'm, I'm very encouraged. I think this is a, the right direction to be heading. Um, this is obviously very difficult. You said it at the very first sentence of the the staff presentation, you know, predicting the future of golf is, I don't pretend to think I can do that. But I think that um, taking this step by step and taking this, this incremental step in the right direction, being optimistic about potential growth is the right thing to do. I think we're just going to have to monitor it. There, there isn't a silver bullet that we can point at this that solves this permanently. And to get, out of respect to the, the last speaker, that would be ideal if we could do that. But that just isn't um, on our that's not in our toolbox. But what we can do is to monitor this very closely and take incremental steps and, and keep on top of it and see where these trends go and then respond to those as they occur. So, and, and this step to increase marketing to the industry standard, to grow golf, to have the programs that folks have spoken about, particularly the youth programs, have a chance to, to grow um, young golfers and add them to, to rounds, responding, um, I think, more having the ability, frankly, to respond with recycled water this year to make the course look better is a big change over last year. And um, I think these are all really positive trends, and I think we just are going to have to be patient to let those gestate and, and bear fruit. And I think I just appreciate the direction that you've, you've presented today and think this is the right course. Mr. White. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I pr presume the questions got mixed in with your comments as well. Yeah, 
Okay. Um, well, the um, I would say one question that I have is about the certificate of, part of participation. That's uh, an institutional document. I mean, that's that's not on the table for change unless I guess the, the general fund could could pay that off. Would be the uh, what's uh, would be a, that would be at least a way to attack that. What's the interest rate on that certificate of participation? Um, uh, Councilmember White, the, the annual commitment, the annual payment that if the general fund were going to take that on, it would be a payment that the general fund makes of 180000 for the next three years. So it's... eighty for the next three yeah, years. Yeah, that is And the interest the, rate on that is? Anyway, that's a question which is not... It doesn't, I don't know doesn't that drive it's anything that any, we can... A discussion at this point, but it's... At this point. Um, well, it could get paid off would be the, would be the option. Okay, so uh, then I'll get to my comments, if I may. Then, of course. Um, all right. First of all, I do support the golf course. Uh, that's not in on my radar for for saying that uh, we. I mean, we've heard of repurposing the land as as something as a as a something to look at, and I I think that this is. Um, this happened once before. I, I was discussing this with uh, Mr. Casey earlier. I believe that the city lost the Montecito Country Club in the in the depression. And uh, as its municipal golf course, the Montecito Country Club is in the city of Santa Barbara, even though it's the Montecito uh, Country Club. And uh, let's not do that again. Uh, let's not. We got lucky with the with the uh, after World War II, uh, the Air Force property getting in our hands, and this is a treasure that we. Uh, it's it's one of the gifts that we've gotten, and let's let's take care of it. Um, and I, uh, uh, Mr. Hart and I, uh, kind of come at, at these questions with, with uh, some similarities and some differences. Uh, the, the word resiliency uh, comes to my mind as, as, as we look at these, uh, as these years. We hear uh, our staff, uh, uh, Mr. Sewell, for example, has been grinding on water uh, but, uh, rates and meters and, and getting down in, into the proverbial weeds to find uh, where, uh, where are we spending money that we don't need to. And I really appreciate uh, the, the, the efforts that our, our staff in many areas are making, and, and in particular, uh, your work has been really, uh, obviously, really important. It's very important to me that when we have the different the range of sixty thousand dollars to five hundred thousand dollars loss. There, those are two different numbers for me. Uh, sixty thousand dollars a year is, as Mr. Hart would say, at budget dust. Uh, five hundred thousand dollars is not. That's that's a that's a dirt clog. And uh, we we uh, clawed, and we'd need to, to uh, if it's a five hundred thousand dollar number, we need to be uh, uh, more all hands on deck uh, than than sixty thousand. Marketing. Uh, this has been. I'm getting feedback from uh, out there in the community that that is a, a weakness of this system. Um, so I appreciate that this is now a, a a front burner issue for our staff and and for our our team on this. I'm very interested in the whole refi, uh, trying to get uh, to work this in a way that, uh, uh, as, as I've said in previous meetings, in my view, uh, the, the, the golf course needs to get darn close to breaking even year in and year out. It sort of just needs to be a stable a system that's not uh, pulling money uh, out of the general fund year in and year out. So. Uh, at the same time, I'm not willing to just cash it in and, and sort of do the austerity uh, move. Uh, if this is our grease, then we need to have some more uh, uh, supportive uh, nurturing going on here on the very short term. But I'm open to ideas around the, the refi. That's why I was asking about the certificate of participation. I think where may, perhaps Mr. Hart and I have a, a different perspective is I, I conceptually, I'm open to contracting out uh, our maintenance. We saw those numbers uh, in the big report that we had um, a month, month or two ago, and that, that was a, it looked to me to be somewhere between a quarter and a, and a half a million dollar uh, reduction in cost. So uh, it's not where I want to go. Uh, I appreciate that uh, I, my, my hierarchy of, of uh, motivations is to keep our employment base. I appreciate that even already 
the numbers here are significant number of part-time workers are in this system and uh, that there's even a desire and even it would, I can see why there'd be a desire to move back to more permanent employees, more, more, better morale, better quality employees, et cetera. But when, we're, when, our, when our ship is, is, is leaking, I'm not sinking, but leaking, that's not a time to be uh, bringing on more uh, permanent employees, in my opinion. So uh, at the same time, and, and I'm not sure, I guess that was another question I was going to ask, was are we talking about the, the two contracts with Mulligans and Pro Shop today, or is that for another discussion? Uh, I, I'm not clear on, on that. That was an insightful comment that our last uh, speaker brought up that this is beginning to look like a, an older uh, a remodel, a facility that was remodeled 25 years ago. That concerns me a little bit. Um, I'm hearing that Mulligans is doing really well, and I've, uh, I've been there a few times myself, and, and it just it seems like it's got some vibrancy to it. But obviously, we have, that's, that's a facility that uh, gets hard use. I also agree that the course of the competing courses, Glen Annie, I think is 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 a could be a foundering uh, operation uh, in, in sort of middle, you know, in, in ten years time. I'd be surprised if it's not either a development with houses all around it or uh, a development that's where the water use is actually substituted uh, out. San Marcos even is uh, struggling. Uh, I'm hearing so um, the. Th the elements that I would come back to today is uh, I'm open to something in the refi area, which would be soften the blow, uh, either in terms of either uh, forgiving payments or uh, lengthening the, the payments to the general fund uh, as a way to uh, lower uh, annual costs. And, um, and if we do not see improvements over a year to let's you know, say year, you know, next year year after um, then I think the notion of contracting out is is still a a, a viable option uh, which I where I don't where I prefer not to go okay thank you mr. chair thank you um, one question so miss Goena told us that it would actually be more expensive to contract out maintenance, but that's not my recollection from the from the report in December. Could you clarify that? Yes, uh, the it's hard to know which financial summary tables are being referred to, and we know because of the difficulties in working with all of those different charts, they took into consideration different factors for different analysis in those charts. But the general savings from contracting out labor was around $180,000, $200,000. Um, that number could increase more. Um, the report um, uh, and I think when we went to council, we assumed that the living wage would not apply to the management agreement. But I think the council discussion was that that it 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 would. So I think the general savings would be somewhere between 180 to 200 plus. If we were going to go back and look at that in terms of really doing it, I think we'd want to do it in terms of. Um, kind of update those numbers because um, it's been a while since we did all that. But that that would be the correct bottom line that we get to. Okay. And if I may, um, uh, Council Member White asked about the status of the two concessions when we were last at Council. I think the the um, direction was status quo which would mean if, if, if that direction stays the same, then staff would begin working on the two concessions. They're two separate discussions, um, and we're frankly not sure uh, what we would do. We haven't had that discussion internally, um, but, but we would begin work on that. Well, if 
I may, Mr. Chair, just that then, then that's not on the table to, today. We've heard about that, and yes, you're always going to be open to comments on that. But what we're talking about is the financial management today, and then you'll be coming back to us with other uh, proposals on the two concessions. Is, is that right? Um, uh, finance committee members, I think what what council asked was for us to bring you options specifically about refinancing the debt. So what we would look for is a recommendation back to council with, you know, refinancing of the debt, if that's something that you want to recommend to council. We're operating on the assumption that um, if you were to do that, that's the element that would change um, because the December 9th discussion was status quo, okay. um, but refinancing the debt. Uh, we would look for you to provide that direction, taking it back to council. We would imagine that would happen sometime in February. Um, staff would like to have some clarity because we're in the process of developing our budget for the next two years. So if, in fact, there's, um, there's no change to the operating model proposed for 16 or 17, then we need to know that, or at least 16 to your budget. And, um, and if, in fact, you want to have further discussion about what other, those other options are, then we need to know that. So we move the conversation forward and get to um, a point where you're able to give staff direction. Okay. Um, so it, does that help? It does. It okay. It does. And um, I'll, I would say that from my perspective, the, the refinancing um, is uh, a good idea. Um, it's it's a, a little bit of a breathing room. Uh, whether that is, uh, and I understand that was a, we were going from a, is it a five year, um, the, the general fund, $500,000 is in a payment of, Mr. Sewell, how much per year? Councilmember White, the general fund um, is currently only interest only, but once the COP were paid, it would then be a payment of 185000 a year. Okay, so now it's so two hundred sixty-two thousand. I see. Now it's twenty-two thousand. Yes, interest okay. only. Okay. And uh, okay, well, from from my perspective, that's of course that's again that's not a big enough number to make any difference, um, but um, the I suppose what ends up happening there then is that in order for the golf fund, we'll get back to the red versus green slide. It can, it can survive by dipping into reserves, going yet further into reserves this next year. And uh, I mean, certainly the, the $22,000 doesn't make any difference to me. Um, but um, then from there, uh, we will be looking at it again next year uh, and seeing how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis uh, this marketing plan, and uh, as I say, I'm open to if you have uh, cons ideas about refinancing. Certainly, I don't expect the golf. I mean, uh, like three years from now, the certif certificate of participation is is paid off. I don't need this the general fund payment to go up to one hundred eighty thousand dollars in a substitute way. That that could be looked at in some kind of, uh, and I see Mr. Samario is uh, wanting to speak here. Sure, Bob Samario, um, Acting Assistant City Administrator. Mark, could you put on that one slide to show the summary of all the debt? I'm not sure we're clear on what we're proposing here. This one? Yes. No. Okay. So the, you can see the three debts that are outstanding currently. Right. Um, the first is are the COPs you were talking about, and that's currently um, requires about $180,000 per year. Through 2018, the the general fund loan, which is interest only now, but will become fully amortized starting after the COPs are fully paid, um, is 500,000. So that'll require 185,000 dollars starting in 2019. Right. 
And then the fleet vehicle loan is being amortized at $60,000 through 2018. The proposal that you saw where it showed the, the impact of refinancing is that we would refinance all of this debt. Okay. So each one of them would be, would essentially go away in terms of their current payment schedule. What it means for the first item though is that the COP is currently 654,000. It would require the general fund to make those payments on behalf of the golf fund for the okay. next three years. Right. Where the others would just be spreading out those payments longer. Okay. But and and does, what's the interest? Do we, do we know what? We don't know what the interest rate is on that COP. Is that right? My guess is in the five to six percent range. Right. So it's but the full the full payment is one hundred eighty thousand dollars per year. Okay. So just to be clear, we're going to we're proposing to refinance finance all of this debt, spreading it out, and it does provide that budgetary relief in the short term. Mm -hmm. Economically, you know, you're refinancing the current debt to a longer period of time, so right. you're going to spend more money over time. But it does right. provide the budgetary relief in the short term. Right. Thank you. So maybe just while Mr. Samario is up there real quickly. So would you imagine that we'd be refinancing this debt over a longer period of time at a lower interest rate? Or are you is all of these yes. charts at so a lower for, interest rate? For example, the $180,000, if you, if you assume it's 6% interest, the COPs, the general fund would be paying that, but only charging 3% interest to the golf fund over that 20-year period. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's important. I think it's important. ironic that we would have had the investment report before this where we see that the city's general fund is getting 1.5% um, on its investments. And we're making it, this is arbitrage that we're basically charging the golf course 6%. So that to me is a no brainer. And that, that is an absolutely defensible policy that makes, that is the appropriate thing to do. And that is, I think the first step that we need to take is just to write that and then see where the numbers are. After having done that, as the marketing unfolds, as we give time for these things to take effect, and then we'll just be back, as we always are, monitoring this closely and making sure that you know we don't have this turn from a sixty thousand dollar number to a five hundred thousand dollar number. Okay, gentlemen. Well, I'll try to keep my comments brief, and perhaps we can come up with a recommendation to the full council. Um, Obviously, I agree with my fellow committee members that the golf course is a great resource for the city, and we want to make sure that it continues in good health and hopefully in greater play. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure that the golf course is financially self-supporting. And that means not just barely keeping its head above water if it dips into reserves, but also accumulating enough money in reserves so that it can make the kinds of capital improvements that are necessary over time. Um, Though I agree that the refinancing gives us a little bit of breathing room, it's not a real solution to the long-term financial problem. What we're seeing in these most, most recent numbers is that play is continuing to decline. Hopefully, this new marketing effort will help turn that around or at least stabilize it. Uh, but given the trends that we've seen in recent years, we certainly can't count on that. Now, the uh, contracting out of the maintenance if that would save the golf fund $200,000 a year in expenses, I don't see how we can avoid looking at that. I mean, that is the one obvious immediate cure. This is not giving us breathing room. This is actually solving the problem. So what I would recommend if I were making the motion to council is that certainly we look at the refinancing, that we uh, say, hooray, to the improved marketing plan. I think that's a good idea. But I also think that we have to realistically look at contracting out maintenance as we are contracting out everything else at the golf course. And if that is the only realistic move for keeping the golf course both self-supporting and healthy as a golf course, it's pretty obvious to me which choice we have to make. So I... I feel that we would be remiss if we don't at least recommend that the city council look at that because I don't think there's any other realistic solution. But I'd be happy to entertain a motion. I would move that we recommend that the council support the new marketing efforts and refinancing of the debt. Is there a second? Um, I would ask that the, that the motion include and that we at least look at contracting out next year uh, again. Just bring that back up for another uh, review. Well, we could do that next year. Okay, well, is that okay to make that part of the motion? No. Okay. 
Uh, is there a second? Well, I would make a motion that uh, I would make my colleagues' motion and add that uh, we include uh, looking at contracting out next year. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The story continues.